Hi class, it's Bill back with the last video in our series on linked lists. In the first video we gave the basics. In the second video we talked about algorithms and some of the key code that you need to learn. And now we're talking about our little implementation details and a couple other little wrap-up goodies that we might want to follow up on. So let's jump back to where we were. Here we go. So what is a dummy node? Why do we do this? Well, let's set up the problem first and let's talk about why this can help solve it. The thing that we're going to see in a lot of our code is that we are continually, perpetually, special casing the front list, the front reference rather. So we are always writing code to special case it like this. If the front is null, right, if the list is empty, then we have to point front to the new node. Otherwise, if it's not empty, then we have different code. So our code is very frequently special casing front because front is not a node. Remember, front is not a node. It's a reference to a node. So the code for it is different than it is when we just have nodes and we're doing our normal references. So we have to think about front differently so far, right, in the code that we've written so far. But one of the things that's very typical with linked lists, and you'll see this in samples online, perhaps in your textbook, is sometimes we insert an extra node at the beginning that has its data null. Its purpose is not to be treated as a node, but instead to be treated as a starting point. So the dummy node sits here between the front reference and the first actual data node, but its purpose is, rather than us starting at front and worrying about front all the time, we always start at front.next. And that way, every piece of code that we write is always dealing with a node. It's never dealing with the front reference, right? Because we would always be here. For instance, if we need to add at the beginning, we would never add it here, right? It would always go after the dummy node. So the code to add something in the front is always going to be the same, and we don't have to look and see if the list is empty first. So dummies can be, dummy nodes can be very, very useful. And in fact, you'll, you'll see that probably you'll want to use these things to make your code easier. But you'll see both ways in, in uh, samples online and samples in, in text, perhaps. So here's typical code. Add at position, right? So I w if I want to add a node at a particular position, right, add a particular reference at that position, uh, what I first have to do is say, hey, if the thing is null, right, if my list is empty, then I just point front to that newly created student, right? I make a new node, I pass the student in, great. So that's great. Otherwise, if the list is not empty, I first have to go get the node at that particular position specified, one before it, because remember, current needs to end up before it. And then I point that new node to the, uh, the new student that I just created. Then I can do my normal kinds of navigation, right? So that makes sense. So that's great, except, again, special casing, right? There's a lot of special casing code here for front. What if I had a dummy? If I had a dummy, notice all that goes away. What do I need to do? Well, I'm going to say get node at position minus one. Well, what if they said they wanted at position zero? No big deal, because then current points at the dummy. So regardless, current points at the right place, and that is never front. Right, Front is, is out of the picture now. So current is always pointing at the right place because it's pointing at the first dummy node if that's necessary. And then all this code works exactly as it did before. Right? Current.next then becomes the dummy nodes next or whatever it is. Right, So this basically eliminates the need for the special casing of front all the time. So dummy nodes can be very useful. You just need to remember that you're always starting at front.next, not front. So when you're traversing, when you're counting, things like that, you just have to remember you're always going to start over one. So that makes a lot of sense. So hopefully that uh, that is something that's resonating with you. If not, again, take, take a look at it, come back, uh, go and look at some sample code uh, in some different ways uh, that use dummy nodes and that don't, right? Now, one other thing I want to point out is for our courses, I typically use BlueJ as our IDE, but I just want to make a little promotional push for one that does a very nice job with illustrating data structures, and that is called JGrasp. And JGrasp 
uh, even though we don't use it in our courses, does this one thing brilliantly. And that is when you write link list code, you can have it show up in what's called canvas view. You can, you can load the project up and switch to canvas view. You can say what variable you want to follow, right? You're going to follow your list variable. And then as you create these things, it's actually going to show you an illustration of the link list being created at runtime. So that is pretty cool, right? If you want to really get a visualization of how these things get created, the new nodes, the pointer remapping, and all of that, JGrasp is really, really cool for that. To make this work, you'll need to start JGrasp. You'll need to create a new project, and then you'll need to bring in those files, all your Java files that you have that you want to run. You're going to want to load up main, you have to set a breakpoint and then find the local variable and drag it into this area once you've created this thing called a canvas. In the UI, that's going to be here. See this button that looks like a little canvas on an easel. So you're going to get that set up and then make sure that you have a reference here in the canvas to this variable. It might be automatic. If not, you can drag it into the canvas. You can set a delay so that you can watch this thing go so you can make it go faster or slower. Once you do all of this, I just want to show you the uh, the good news about how JGrasp really shows you this in a very visual way. So let me just run it and let you watch. You can also see it, by the way, in your code, right? You'll see the code over here and I'm just going to press the play so that it goes on into the, the code. So you'll see visually there's this thing called current, there's a new node, and you'll see it bringing those into the list when it changes the references. That added it in the middle, that was cool. Add at the end, that's cool. Notice here we're going to do some remove operations so you'll see the list getting smaller as it points around things, etc. So the nice thing again about JGrasp is that it's very visual. It's one of the more visual tools that I've seen. This Canvas program is the key thing here. Now you can't use this with a list with 10 million items in it. It is kind of limited, but a lot of times what you're doing with these with these basic algorithms is you're just getting the, the basics working anyway. So this is not going to be maybe a tool for debugging when you've got 500 list elements, but in this case getting your algorithms working and see them kind of doing their thing and uh, visually coming together can be a useful thing. So sometimes JGrasp is great. It'll also do trees very nicely, right? So when we look at binary trees or trees of any kind, JGrasp can also do this nice visualization with the trees. So just letting you know that tool is out there. If you think that that would be something useful, go look it up and go figure it out. All right, so last little piece here before we look at references is what is what are other things that we've got to think about here to really make a link list work well in code? What do we have to think about? Well, first thing is generics, right? Because again here, we don't want to write different code for a student link list versus a customer link list versus a whatever, right? We'd like to make the, li the link list work for whatever class happened to be needed. So of course we could make these generic, right? We would make the nodes generic, we need to make the list generic. How would that look? Not very hard really. Also, what if we are doing frequent operations at the end of the list? What if we're doing a lot of add at end? Or maybe we want to move backward through the list as well as forward. How could we do that, right? So having an end reference as well as a front reference could solve this first problem. What if we wanted to go backward and forward through the list? This is called a doubly linked list. And there's no reason that you couldn't have both a next pointer and a previous pointer, right? So that you could use move both forward and backward through the list. That could be cool. Now, which of our methods are going to change? How does our code change when we need to move differently through the list? So all of these things become very interesting. How do they help our methods change? How do our 
How do our other methods change? How do dummy notes change, right? Because if we're going to have a list that we can start at the end, move forward and backward, we're probably going to put a dummy at the beginning and the end. So a lot of interesting things. And again, an excellent academic and brain exercise for you to code some of these things up yourself uh, so that you're super, super clear on how they work and your brain will be ready for other kinds of data structures work because you've really gotten this reference thing down and how you can use pointers, references, to build them. So very cool stuff. There are some references linked here. There is some discussion here about the dummy node, so it's a good reference for that. And it also talks about cyclical lists, where the last item points back to the first item. So what are the interesting algorithmic challenges with that? Well, obviously you can think about that a little, and that reference is a good place to start. So pause if you need to pick that up. That brings us to the end, finally, of our link list discussion. That's three videos. That should be enough. Uh, but we've covered a lot of important ground, and we've gotten the basis of doing a lot of our other data structure work, which is going to be using references in interesting ways. So when we get into working with trees, we're not going to be that surprised that these references are going to be used there and with a lot of our other data structures that we may construct. So thanks for watching this video series. I hope you're finding it useful and learning a lot. We'll see you in the next one, hopefully. We'll come back and continue with week five and the rest of the quarter. Lots of cool stuff ahead. Thanks for watching.